close to the holy ground The tears will always have wet Eyes I cry but answer Five on a mission I will let you go Welcome, welcome to our sixth couch lessons. I'm very happy to see so many faces from all over the world. My name is Jeanette and I work for the Goethe Institute in Munich and maybe not everyone is familiar with the Goethe Institute. So I just wanna say two sentences about it. Uh, we are the worldwide uh, cultural Worldwide Active Cultural Institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the study of the German language abroad and we encourage international cultural exchange. We decided to address the subject AI because we believe that the developments in this field have a huge impact on our society. AI will contribute to a new revolution in human history. And it is already an important part of our everyday life. Artificial intelligence powers Google's search engine, enables Facebook to target advertising and allows Alexa and Siri to do their jobs. AI is composing music and, it, and painting pictures. AI is also behind self-driving cars, predictive policing and autonomous weapons that can kill without human intervention. These and other AI applications raise complex ethical issues and a lot of questions. How intelligent can machines become and can they make fair decisions? Are we threatened by the automation of society through algorithms and AI? Will initially human skills such as the creation of art be computerized? Or will AI make the world a better place by helping us solve big problems such as climate change, pandemics and inequalities? With our project, Generation A is algorithm, we want to sensitize young adults for the risks, for the challenges, but also for the opportunities presented by the developments in the field of AI. We want to raise the awareness of young people because we think that they will set the course for a future generation, a Generation A and their life with algorithms. Our goal is to initiate a discussion outside the technology savvy community and to provide a platform for dialogue between different disciplines and backgrounds, for example, with philosophers or with artists and their approaches to AI. Our couch lessons are a perfect example for this. Every week, always on Wednesday, we discuss with AI experts from all over the world about different aspects of this technology. We ask them what opportunities AI offers and where critical reflection is necessary. As AI shapes our society for better or worse, it should be on us all to decide what direction we will take. The couch lessons are an invitation to find meaning behind the technical advancements in this field and inspire new ways of thinking. We hope you're ready for a new episode. We hope you have made yourself comfortable, maybe on a couch, maybe with a cold drink in your hand. And we hope that you enjoyed the music that you have heard at the beginning of the couch lesson. It was the song Blue Jeans and Bloody Tears, the first Eurovision song created by an artificial intelligence. Therefore, a deep learning algorithm had been fed with hundreds of Eurovision lyrics and melodies. So can AI be creative? This was the topic of our last couch lesson. And this week we want to speak about AI and ethics. But before we start with the inputs from our experts, we would like to ask you to participate in a poll that we have prepared. And you can give as many answers as, as you want. And as long as we wait for the answers, I want to introduce some of the guidelines of the couch lessons briefly. We always start with an input of our experts, each about 15 minutes long. And after the inputs, we open the discussion. You can always contribute your questions or thoughts into our chat. And I will read the chat and pick out some of your questions and thoughts. After the inputs, I will ask some people to speak out. But if I don't ask you, please, 
don't unmute your microphone. I also want you to note that the entire event is recorded, but we just record the persons that are speaking. You can always turn off your video, although we would recommend to switch it on so that we can see all the participants from all over the world. So that's from my side. Let's have a look on the results of our poll. It's still going on. Yeah. Most people think that AI can help us to make better decisions, fair decisions, but only with the right training data and with the support of the humans. So with this uh, result, I hand over to Martin, my co-host and the moderator of the session. Thank you for listening. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Martin Tunkvist, and uh, during the daytime, I work as a curator and context developer, uh, but tonight I'm, I'm the moderator and I will guide you through the coming uh, 45 minutes. Uh, and with us today, we have two prominent speakers, uh, Sarah Speakerman, who is an author and head of the Institute for Information Systems and Society at Vienna uh, University of Economics and Business. And we also have Carla Hustet, who's a project lead for the ethics of algorithms at project at uh, Bertelsmann Stiftung. Uh, I'm in Malmo, Sweden. Our two speakers are based in Vienna and Berlin. Uh, Jeanette, uh, that you just heard, she's in Munich. Uh, and if you feel like it, please try out uh, the chat function and type where you're dialing in from. Uh, it's always uh, a beautiful image to see uh, that we're actually uh, gathered here today from all around the world. So please go ahead and do that. All there's of Bogota and Mexico and Ukraine, and Jerusalem, and you know, all the places that you want, places that you want to travel, right? Um, and so far in, in the Couch Lesson series, we've covered five quite diverse fields in which AI is utilized, some of which uh, Chanet just mentioned. Um, and some of the aspects of AI development that keeps coming up in our lessons are those of ethics, bias, and privacy. Um, and they're somehow related, and we'll cover them all in our Wednesday sessions before summer vacation is officially on. So there's four more and, and after this, and two of them will be bias and privacy. But today we start this trilogy with, with AI and ethics. Um, and as always, when two huge, quite diverse, and a little fussy around the edges fields of research and thought meet for an hour long discussion, uh, we need to limit the scope of it a bit. Uh, and the goal today is to raise, raise awareness and provide a bit of framework for how to think about ethical perspectives of development, of the development of, and deployment of AI systems. Um, and I think it's interesting because in the AI, the, in the couch lesson session last week on creativity, there was a very good discussion uh, in the very end of the fact that it's the intention of an art piece that gives it a soul. And that is this consciousness, this, this intention that machines currently lack uh, to move us through artistic practices. And for me, uh, the unveiling of intention is a good starting point for, all, for understanding all in, in innovation, uh, not uh, the least uh, technological in innovation. And investigating why a product exist in the first place gives us a good clue to what the innovator really want to achieve with it. And it's also right there in the beginning of the product development journey that we want ethics to play a part as a guiding principle. Um, but does that really happen? And how could it work in practice? And, and uh, how can we as consumers gain tools to see through the promises of improved lives and China gadgets to understand what the technology that we use actually see here, collect and redistribute? This is the type of questions I want you to keep in mind tonight. And now it's, it's time for our first speaker. Her name is Sarah Spiekerman, and she's the head of the Institute for Information Systems and Society at Vienna University of Economics and Business. She's also the author of the book, Ethical IT Innovation. She's the co-chair of Triple IEEE's first ever standard on ethics in IT design. Um, and in addition to this, she has published almost 100 scientific articles on social and ethical implications of computer systems. So I can't think of a better person to introduce us uh, to this topic. So please beam uh, your energy to, to Sarah Speakerman. And the, the screen and microphone is yours. Yes, hello. My name is Sarah Speakerman, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation uh, today. 
Um, I am uh, will be sharing my screen here, and uh, and 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 start out um, on um, the framework of today's talk. Now, when you use the word AI, what do you actually mean? There is a big difference whether you talk about the ethics of a machine learning algorithms and certain data flowing in and something coming out or whether you um, whether you embrace that a lot of people these days use the term AI when they really mean more complex big data driven information systems with perhaps some machine learning components inside of them and I would like um, to embrace this letter definition of AI for today and say, let's think about very complex information systems. And when you hear the word ethics, very often people immediately think about morality. Yeah? What, is, uh, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil? And um, this, this focus on morality is not the focus that um, I'm choosing. Um, I deeply believe that ethics is not only about right and wrong. It's about, um, it's about um, what is worth being in the world, the true, the beautiful, something that is worth uh, living for. As a, so ethics is less about morals and more trying to find a good way for our future. So against this background, let me, let me walk you through through a little journey here. Many people, um, when, they, when they think about AI, so I think the robot Sophia is very well known um, and people believe that the future of AI looks like this. And then there are others who say, yeah, but also autonomous cars who have a lot of deep learning components um, are a form of AI. Or um, when the future is that we will be walking around with um, software agents like Alexa or Siri speaking to us um, constantly while, while, we, while we live, while we are in the future. All of these are visions. Here's another robot. Or also when we are going to delve into, um, into virtual worlds where we will be meeting perhaps artificial personalities that are nothing more than um, um, an AI, a living AI. Um, the, the question... Sarah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think your, your screen froze a bit when you, um, uh, when you made it the full screen. Okay. So maybe, so it's still on the first um, slide. So if, oh, see if we can... that is very sad. So let me... Um, <laughs> Let me, uh, I, I will then in this case not go to the presentation mode. I will um, end the presentation and I will just put a big screen on so that you can better see. I was here with the Sophia, you see her? Yes, we, now it seems to work. Yeah, one. Thank you. And I, I showed you the autonomous car and I showed you the um, Siri, Alexa and so on and the students who are delving into virtual worlds and all of those technologies are presented to us many people would use the term ai and um, then the question is um, all of this is new and is it then automatically good yeah is this um, are these innovations desirable just because they are they are new um, very often today we equate newness and innovativeness as values that are desirable in themselves. And we consider then, we, we say, let's do this. But why? But why, why is that the case? Do we not have to challenge whether what is new, is it really good? And when it comes to all of those sophisticated and huge information system, I would rather say um, they have a lot of uh, good ideas in them and they are like a good piece as a, a drink of wine. But in fact, that can also be a point where it's just enough or where it's not good necessarily to have more of it. Yeah. 
And um, this is why one of the core hypotheses in my work on, on, on ethics for AI or ethics for complex information systems is that um, we do see value creation with some degree of digitization, but the question is whether there is a point of inflection where more digitization and more AI, if you want to, is not what we really should be having and wanting. And why is that? Because um, right now, every day, we can observe that the information systems that we are using in our daily lives um, create problems for people and for society at large. Um, for instance, when our mobile phones, very sophisticated machines, yeah, um, are configured such that they make us addictive or that we get health issues using them all the time or that we have privacy issues because they are observing every, the way we sit, the way we sleep, the way we talk, the way our emotions are going. So they're highly privacy intrusive and Good Institute will have a session on that. They are manipulating votes or they, um, um, some AI systems used in the court now um, may be undermining our dignity when they are biased or, or simply the data that is used for them is simply wrong. So what is happening is that we are seeing value problems arising. And when I talk about digital ethics, I I am always trying to understand the value balance, how much value is created in the positive sense and how much is destroyed in, um, through negative values. This is how I look at ethics and this is also how I look at ethics for AI specifically. Now, the question is, um, seeing these um, yeah, daily challenges around um, technology, um, is there a way um, to, in fact, build technology in such a way that it will benefit us and foster our values, but at the same time, not undermining our values, like those that I just presented as examples? And when you talk with um, experts these days on, on how they view this um, crossroads, then almost everyone, as of the majority of um, the institutions and thinkers on this matter, would be saying, oh, what we need is some red lines, or what we need is we need to focus on certain values that absolutely need to be in place in order to have an ethical technology. So you see here on the slide um, a screenshot from, uh, the, from, a, from an article, from, a, from a journal called Nature Machine Intelligence, and they went out and realized that there were over 80 um, institutional, um, let's say something like um, yeah, li value lists published in the past um, five to, to, to eight years where institutions like the European Commission or British uh, Standardization Board or also companies came up with lists of what they think artificial intelligence should have as values. And um, for example, if you, I, I, um, when you, what, they, what, this what this journal article did is to say, so what are these values that everyone is talking about, these lists, what should be on the list? And they saw, saw that they're, not all the lists are identical, but they share some commonality. For instance, um, I, I tried to dig out what are the commonalities here. You see that in theory, these institutions who are publishing the list would all agree that transparency is very important or that AI needs to be fair and has no bias, or that it needs to be um, secure, yeah, the data needs to be encrypted, 
for um, also privacy as a very important value is, 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 is often outlined. And um, this, is, this is all good and true. I, I want to give you an example here of a speech assistant like Google Assistant or Amazon Echo that outlines how privacy is indeed an issue. So um, when, you, um, when you talk to the machine that tries to understand your voice, um, you believe it's just trying to, to understand what you're saying. But um, look at the following US patent that is currently owned by um, Google, I believe, and was formerly owned or even filed by Amazon. Unfortunately, the animation does not work here. But what, you, what, the, what all these words here are saying is, what does the agent actually record about the conversation? It records whether you are stressed, what your voice is like, whether you have a sore throat, whether you are coughing, whether you are emotionally happy, bored, sleepy, sad, or depressed, what your purchase history is, what your browser history is, what, how you can be targeted behaviorally, where your current location, location is, um, where, you, as where you live, what you did in the past, um, also um, whether you have an accent, um, whether you are male or female, how many people are in the household, what age you are, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in fact, a voice assistant like Google um, Assistant or Alexa would be taking in so much more data um, than you would expect. And now what is this patent about? This patent is about calculating the ideal moment for example, when you are, let's say, you're coughing in the, mo in the morning, and that's actually an ideal moment to sell you um, some, um, some, some sweets for your, or some, some medication for your sour throat. So what this patent is about is about auctioning off exactly that moment to pharmaceutical companies so that then the Alexa or Google Speech Assistant could Tell, tell you, oh, Sarah, um, you, have a, you, you have a sour throat. Don't, don't you want to buy um, such and such um, product? So these perfect moments to sell people a product are being auctioned off. And um, then you could ask the question, is this ethical? And um, you'd probably feel that to a certain extent, your, your, your privacy is, is, is being breached. But there is more to this example because um, let's say, let's imagine um, you are, um, it's, it's not about your a sour throat, but um, the agent knows you are depressed, you are emotionally low. Is it fair then to offer um, such a person an antidepressive? How far can you go? In, uh, in, 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 in offering people something to buy. Um, so the thing is that um, the, I think the example shows that to a certain extent, lists like those that the Nature magazine brought together have a function. They are talking about relevant values, values that we must and should respect in the design of machines. However, I would like to make clear in today's talk that from my perspective, such lists are no more than hygiene factors of um, what uh, um, the producers and service providers of those machines must deliver. Hygiene factors, the absolute minimum that such privacy breaches should not happen. And um, that it is also, yeah. So, um, and why do I say that they're just hygiene factors? Because um, ethics is about much more than just prohibiting harm. Ethics, as I tried to say at the beginning of the talk, is about being good. And the people I portray here on the slide if you, if you were thinking yourself, if you're brainstorming about people 
who you believe are ethical. Perhaps you would have thought about the people here on the slide. And what is it that makes these people role models for ethics? Um, this tells us a lot about what ethics really is. Um, it is, as a first matter, it's about being a certain kind of, per of person, trying to be a virtuous person, as Aristotle would have said. And Aristotle, in his Nicomachean Ethics, describes that a good person would be, he describes many virtues like courage and generosity and, and, and being sincere and, and honest. Um, so it's about being a certain kind of person. And when you, when you look at this slide with these three people, you might think, oh, but this is completely outdated. But no, if you, if you think about modern series like Netflix series or, or, the, or the other series like Game of Thrones, I could put other actors here in, that are in our fantasy like Jon Snow in Game of Thrones, for instance, who are incorporating virtues. And um, to go a little bit more into detail also of our of known ethical theories, what else is it that con what contributes to good behavior? We know, for example, the duty ethical perspective to say, are there certain values of virtues that are so important to me, I think they should be universal values, personal maxims in a Kantian sense, or treating human beings as ends in themselves and not just abusing them, for instance, for profit. Perhaps you could interpret the Alexa example also, where, where, where you could argue that here you are abusing the user and you treat him as, 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 as a consumer who must buy something. Um, and finally, um, being aware of potential harms and benefits where you weigh the pros and cons. So any technical work or organizational endeavor that aims to work towards the ethical we need to keep these grander aspects of ethicality in mind. This is what I, I am proposing. I think when we build technology, we have to go beyond prescribed lists that tell us tick the box for privacy, tick the box for transparency, and instead ask, how can technology be built such that it respects these general guidelines of ethics. And I will give you some more examples. Uh, one more example, we'll leave you as an example. But what I want to say is that I have been co-chairing, been a co-chair for four years of the first global standard for, built by IEEE, the largest engineering association on earth, where we really try to get this kind of broader and more holistic thinking about ethics into the corporate process, into the process where as an innovation team, we are building technology. And our goal here is to make us people more virtuous. Of course, we will perhaps not be the Pope and we will be not um, Mother Therese, but, but we, we want to build technology in such a way that it allows us to be better and to, to foster our skills and to foster our values and to promote us yeah, in this broader ethical sense. Um, and what the three questions we are asking for that um, in the standard is that a lot of things have to be well organized in the project. But when we look at the technology like Alexa or Google Speech Assistant, we would be asking three questions. What are all thinkable positive and negative consequences you can envision from the system's use for direct and indirect stakeholders? What are the negative implications of the system for the character or the personality of direct and indirect stakeholders. For instance, if technologies make us addictive, what kind of personality are we when we are passive, uh, passive addicts? Yeah? 
And finally, which ones of the identified values and virtual effects of a technology would you consider as so important that you would want their protection to be recognized as a universal law? So these three questions are in the IEEE standard to reflect on technology in a broader sense. And what a critical philosopher among you might recognize is that these utilitarianism, virtual ethics, duty ethics are from the Western philosophical canon. So that what we also do, and that's very important, is say, but also think about your background, your tech, your, your um, origins. So um, when you're coming from India or you're a Buddhist or you're Confucian, or you're a Christian, you have your own spiritual and religious traditions of what is good and bad and what role models are. And we invite innovation teams to think about what technology does to those values as well. Um, so out of your own cultural frame of thinking and tradition, what values are impacted by the system? And um, I leave you now with one, with one little case where you see how important this kind of thinking is. Because when you go back to the speech assistant, yeah, um, I give you a story here. When you ask an American Amazon ecosystem and you say, um, oh, I, I'm so sad and I don't feel well, then the American system would answer you, oh, if I had arms, I would love to hug you. If a user says the same thing in Russia to the speech assistant from Yandex, from the company Yandex, and, and would say, oh, I don't feel well, and I'm so sad today, then this, the speech assistant actually answers, who told you that life is a piece of cake? You see that the, there is a huge difference in the way that the AI is answering. The value of consolation that is very culture specific, the way you raise your children with a speech assistant and the way you want the culture, the digital, digital woven culture to be very much depends, as a lot depends on how you configure the agent for not a piece of cake or for wanting to be hugged. That's the true question. These are, this has, this is an example of a truly ethical question that shows you that we have to think about much more than privacy and transparency. And we have to think about the reality with these devices for instance, how you live consolation, how you want to live friendship, how you can support mental health, how these devices will trigger joy in life that's culturally very different, to what extent it will foster discipline, to what extent it must recognize the locality and the local community and the local heterogeneity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was a really good uh, primer to ethics uh, and ethics and AI in particular. Uh, we will invite you back at the end for the Q&A. So everybody, please keep asking questions in the chat and we'll make sure to uh, incorporate them in the discussion after the talks. Um, and now we're gonna go into our second speaker. Her name is Carla Hustet and she leads the Bertelmann Stiftung's Ethics of Algorithms project. Uh, and that is a project that deals with the social uh, consequences of algorithmic decision-making. Um, hold on, my nose disappeared. Uh, and she will present some of the work, but I also strongly recommend to check uh, the project out in its entirety. I'll uh, post a link in the chat in a, in a minute, but, but for now, please welcome uh, Carla. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Sure, thanks for having me and hi everybody. It's so amazing to see that people tuned in from so many different spaces around the world. I think this is, I've given a lot of presentation on this topic, but never one that this international. So that's just great. Um, let me share my screen. Let's see. Yes. 
Can you see it now? Yes, we do. Yes. Good. Let me switch to presentation mode and see if that works this time. Do you see it when I switch the slide? Perfect. Mm, so maybe I just say one or two words about the Bertelsmann Stiftung because some of you might not be familiar with the organization. The Bertelsmann Stiftung is um, a German foundation. It's actually Europe's largest operational foundation. And we're active in a large variety of fields from education to healthcare, uh, labor market, and my project, the Ethics of Algorithms project, is um, doesn't have a sectoral focus, but looks at how algorithmic systems are used in um, areas of life that have profound impact on questions of social justice and participation. So the kind of application cases we look at might not be things that you interact with on a daily basis or that you might be aware of, such as search engines or the mentioned Alexa system, but the impact they have on your lives are equally big, if not bigger. So I'm talking about um, the use of algorithmic decision making for diagnosis of diseases or for the development of treatment plans, for deciding where students go to university, for predictive policing, so decisions made on where police officers patrol, or in credit scoring processes, so algorithmic uh, systems deciding who gets a credit and who doesn't. And um, we do this work, we look at these cases through three different roles in my project, one being as an agenda setter, so in the discourse on the issue, which is oftentimes very focused on economic questions and on technical questions, we try to raise awareness on the societal issues. And we also serve, this is our second role, as a convener. So we create spaces where people from different disciplines and sectors can come together and discuss these societal questions. Because a lot of the things that Sarah has just brought up, it showed her presentation showed very well that this is not just a topic that can be addressed from a technical perspective solely or from a philosophical perspective solely, but that we rather need an interaction between these different viewpoints. And lastly, we also um, work as solution developers and piloters, which is actually what I want to focus on today. So there's a lot of ideas out there already of how we can actually put the ethics into the code. Um, solutions we can use to make sure that um, the technology serves society and increases social justice. And I want to present some of these ideas today. But before I do that, I want to start with three things we need to understand about algorithmic decision making. Because if we do not understand these things, then there's no way we can develop effective solution. And I think the first one um, actually became quite clear in Sarah's presentation, which is that algorithmic decision making systems um, are neither per se good or per se bad, but they're not neutral either. And I actually believe that um, algorithmic decision making can help us make more efficient, more consistent, and thereby also fairer decisions, because I'm actually a political scientist and I focused on gender inequality for a long time. So I looked at how human decision making leads to discrimination in a conscious or also subconscious way. And I think that's something we should not forget that human decision making is not flawless either. And I do believe that with the help of algorithmic decision making, and I saw in the survey that you all actually agree, we can make better decisions, even fairer decisions. But we also are all familiar with these cases of facial recognition systems that work better for men than they do for women, or better on white skinned people than they do on people with darker skins. Um, you might have also heard of the example of Amazon that came into the news, I think it was beginning of 2019, where they started using um, a hiring algorithm. So they used an AI system to scan applications. And what happened was that the system, which was trained on data from the past, past employees of Amazon, started sorting out applications by women solely because the current workforce of Amazon, just like most tech companies, was mostly male. 
The second thing we need to know is that algorithmic decision-making systems are socio-technological systems. That means the impact that they have does not just depend on the model, the algorithmic model itself, or on the data, but as Sarah said, also or particularly on the underlying goals. What is the system actually used for? But also on the social embedding. If there's a human at the end, the so-called human in the loop, are they informed on how the system works? Do they know what the goal is of the system? All these kind of questions will have an impact on yeah, whether we, the system actually helps us to create a more fair society or not. And the last one is um, that algorithmic decision-making systems are not what we need to fear, but instead it's the people hiding their responsibility behind the technology. And this is something we see quite a lot when we look at cases where AI created more harm than good. And it can be for two reasons. It can either be because people connected to the thesis number one do think that technology is neutral and therefore overly trusted. They don't question the decision. Or it can be because they consciously try to hide their responsibilities behind the system. And this is one of many reasons why I'm actually not talking about artificial intelligence, what, why I prefer the term algorithmic decision-making systems, because the narrative around this intelligent being is actually what creates the impression that AI systems are something autonomous and makes us forget that there's always people behind it, building the technology, deciding over their use. And in addition to that, there's some cases where um, the technology used is actually super simple, so-called rule-based systems, but the impact on people's lives is equally big. So it's not the complexity of the technology, but rather where the technology is used that we should focus on. And as complex as the development process is, and as complex as the causes of problems can be, um, that's why we cannot have a silver bullet. There cannot be one AI law that will solve it all and that will help us to create a better world, but it's rather, um, I always call it a puzzle of many, many different solutions that need to work together. And I want to present four of these, or like it's four solution fields, I would call them, with a lot of action needed within these four fields. And the first one is um, a call for a broad societal debate. And um, as for now, what we do in our project, we, we also ask people how much they actually know about algorithmic decision-making, how they feel about the topic in different application cases. And what we've seen in our representative surveys, both in Germany, but also in Europe, is that there's actually very little knowledge on the topic and that people are currently not aware that um, this is not a topic of science fiction or of the future, but this is happening right now, right now that there's algorithmic decision-making already having profound impact on people's lives. And um, as Sarah said, there's values that are behind the technology, ethical questions that are behind the technology. And at the end, it's the question of what kind of society we want to live in that needs to be, be debated on a broad societal level. Because if there's one thing I honestly fear, it's the developers making these ethical decisions, which is why I'm later gonna talk about a tool that actually makes sure they don't. Um, the second one is the topic of oversight and accountability. I don't think that we do need new fundamental rights for the digital, digital age, but I do think that we need to check whether current legislation and current protection mechanisms are still suitable in times of automation. And we need to look at, for example, civil society watchdog organizations and oversight bodies within fields like education and medicine. And we need to see if they need competence building, if they um, need financial means in order to deal with the increased efficiency, for example, of automation of decision-making processes. And also whether they actually have access to do their job to these systems. Um, this falls under the topic of transparency. And there's oftentimes when you say this in a round with people who are coming more from the private sector side, there's always this outcry that we cannot open up our code. This is like a business secret or people will start manipulating the system. And um, 
there's different answers to this. One being that transparency does not, an oversight does not always mean you need to open the whole code. Of course, if that is possible, um, that's a great thing. As in the case of the Corona app that was just developed and published in Germany, they actually decided to make the whole source code public on GitHub. And of course, this can help to um, yeah, find mistakes. It can help to build trust. And it's a great example that I hope will set a standard. But there's also other methods that we know from different sectors of how you can achieve oversight without these risks, for example, by establishing in-camera procedures where certain oversight entities get a, have a look into the code and it's not actually released to the wider public. The same thing um, goes actually for the people who are affected by the system. If I'm part of a decision-making procedure, let's say in hiring, and somebody sends me the code in order to create transparency, this won't really help me because I probably won't understand it. It won't really inform me on how the decision was made. So what is key here is that we also understand that transparency is not the same as intel intelligibility and that we also need to make, um, we also need to take on a design and a psychology perspective to actually make these very complex decisions understandable for people affected. Thirdly, we need diversity, an ecosystem fostering diversity of systems, because if there's just one system in place, for example, for filtering applications, the potentials of harm are much larger co in comparison to like a variety of systems. And at the same time, we need to make sure that the people deciding over the use of the system and building the systems are diverse as well. And in the past, this is actually not a new thing. In the past, we've seen many examples of what goes wrong when people involved in technological development do not represent societal diversity. For example, um, for years, for decades actually, women had double the chance of dying in a car accident than men for the simple reason that these crash test dummies that are used to develop the safety systems in cars were developed based on the average body size of men, not of women. And we see these things repeating, although we know that this is a problem, that data sets cannot just represent one part of society, we see it being represented again and again. I already mentioned the example of facial recognition, um, working better on white people than on people with darker skin colors. And um, there's actually a lot to do in this field, because if we do look at the workforce of the big tech companies, they're mostly white and they're mostly male right now. In order to change that, it's also not such an easy thing. Um, we need to change the image of computer science. We need to make it more application focused. And of course, there's a need for cultural change within tech companies. And the last field I think needs less explaining, it's competence building, which basically forms the basis for all the other fields. Among people who decide over the use of the technique, they need to be aware of these three theses that I presented to you, but also um, awareness that is not on a technical level, but more on an ethical level among the people building the systems. Like I said, I do not want programmers to be the one making decisions about fairness, equality of justice, but they need to know that what they're working on does have an impact on people's lives and how they can put the right technical measures into place and how they can work with existing mechanisms to make sure that responsibilities aren't hidden behind the technology. Um, how am I with time? Um, that's a good question. You have uh, <laughs> uh, minus one minute. Okay, then I'll go through the rest really quick. Um, this is just some headlines I wanted to share with you because they're just a great example of how that activism actually works. They're all from the past two weeks where IBM, Amazon and Microsoft all announced that they would either drop out of the facial recognition market completely or at least um, stop working with law enforcement agencies on the topic of facial recognition. And um, we shouldn't thank these companies in this case, we should mostly thank civil society and science activists that have been working on this topic for years. Um, if you're interested on the issue of facial recognition and it's really not just about bias, to be honest, um, a perfectly working facial recognition system can create even more harm. 
you should check out a page called Gender Shades by Joy Buen Lamwidi, who has really done great work on the topic. And last but not least, I think we can also move this to the discussion. I wanted to present to you one um, practical solution that we have been working on together with a variety of stakeholders from different disciplines, which is the AI ethics uh, label. And Sarah Spiekermann has mentioned that there's not, right now a lot of guidelines out there for the ethical development of um, AI. And us, the Bertelsmann Stiftung, together with the IRETS Lab, uh, one of these organizations that put out guidelines, the ALGO rules, um, maybe I can post the link in the chat later. But after we published these guidelines, we were facing the real challenge, which is how do we actually put them into practice? How do we make sure that they're actually being implemented? And um, so for the past year, we've been working on the development of this label, which might remind you of the energy efficiency label, which we know from um, washing machines or uh, technological appliances in the kitchen, and which can actually be used to, um, of course, again, it's not a silver bullet, but it can be used to create transparency over the values of a system between people developing it, so software companies, and um, people purchasing the system. So for example, if I am a government body and I want to use a system for the issue of um, procurement or for predictive policing, I can use um, our guidelines to actually put certain ethical requirements into my procurement standards and to then compare different types of systems that are out there and get a feeling for which one serves my purpose the best. And the same actually goes for the people developing these systems who can um, use our method for the operationalization of like very general broad topics such as transparency and privacy to see what actually needs to be done to implement transparency, reliability, justice, privacy, and to then make it visible what they have done and uh, to sell their product to yeah, customers. Um, and okay, last thing I'm gonna say is if you take one thing from this talk, it should be that we are not helpless, that this is not something that's coming over us, but that it's actually always humans behind the technology and that we can, and we have to shape it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carla, and thank you to you as well, Sarah. Two really, really good presentations. Uh, that at least gave me some new frameworks through which I could uh, think about the opportunities and complexities about ethics and AI. And please keep asking questions uh, in the chat. Uh, I, I would like to ask the first question, actually, and that's to both Sarah and, and Carla. And I, I'm curious, I mean, are you optimistic? And where do you see this discourse? And is there traction? Are you being heard? or? What's, uh, what's the current state of ethics uh, in AI systems? You wanna start? Um, I, I must say that at, at the moment, I'm, I'm not very optimistic. Um, the reason being uh, um, that there are still as well, there, this, 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 this modern belief about the machine um, bringing salvation over us. Yeah? Um, the idea that everything that's new, if we can replace simply everything, um, this, this, uh, this terminology like digital transformation. Um, there is so much money behind it and, and so many fantasies. Um, that I'm wondering what degree of disillusionment is necessary in order for companies to really seriously embrace more than the hygiene factors. Um, when it comes to the embracing of these labels, I believe that uh, companies will be fighting heavily to ensure that they are looking good on the labels. Um, I could imagine that something like that will still be um, adopted for sure. And I, I, I think it's important that at the same time, as I tried to illustrate in the talk, 
um, 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 there could still be, you know, imagine something like passiveness, addiction, resolution of one of, of our own identity. Things like that are not on the label, um, can't be on the label naturally, but um, but these are the grander um, uh, questions if we as humanity go through a ne second Neolithic uh, um, revolution here, um, we, we are uh, we are facing bigger questions and these are not uh, thought of. I think I'm a bit more optimistic. Um, I think at least in the terms of, uh, or at least looking at Germany maybe, or Europe overall, um, because something that I have seen is that there's been more awareness on the importance of the topic in the last couple of years, that there's a lot of political processes happening, the European Commission, has recently published their white book and they opened um, it up for consultation. There's in Germany a lot of different um, interdisciplinary, intersectoral working groups working on the topic and um, we're already seeing some progresses in certain areas. I mentioned the, the Corona app before, which um, is now in Germany, they're now using a so-called decentralized model, which is really the best option when you look at, for example, data protection issues. And um, they opted for that option because there was such an intense um, discussion between science and civil society. And they had actually, they wanted to go for a different one and change their mind, which is a great example of, again, how activism can have an impact if um, politics are open to listen to them and to start this debate and also to switch once they've made a decision. And um, I would agree with Sarah that there's a huge challenge when it comes to redesigning our society and that sometimes technology can, or the way we think about technology can be in the way of that, but that's really a broader societal challenge for me. And yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna hand over to, to Jeanette who will, uh, uh, give the microphone to people in the participating audience. Thank you very much. Um, there has been yeah, quite a lot of questions. I first have to unmute everyone, I guess. Uh, ah, it's already done. So uh, we have a question from Anna Strasser about, for Carla. Maybe you want to speak, Anna? Yes, thank you for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, I wonder what kind of device would um, have the label G in all three areas. So I can imagine the optimistic side, what we wish they have, but I cannot really imagine a device sort of failing in every six areas. Do you have anything in mind? Because if you have no worst case, then, then the, the worst label is just for making me feel better. And it's I mean, this, this for now, we have not applied this label. There's actually um, only specification of what the different uh, values mean for three out of those, how many are there? I think six, six. labels. So it's, it's really hard for me to give you an answer uh, because it depends really on how to operationalize it. Like I said, things like justice and transparency, they can mean so many different things. And um, again, there's another thing that would, that would influence the way I answer this question, which is whether you opt for um, a minimal approach. So you say, if you rank um, G in one of the values, then it cannot be balanced out through a better ranked value in another area. Or you can say that you go for a multiplying approach. So if you're really good in one field and you're quite bad in the other, then this can balance each other out. And we actually haven't made a decision on this because it's also not up to us. What, when we presented this label, it was really um, to speed up the debate in a moment where the European Commission started working on the topic because we felt that there were so many buzzwords out there like transparency and very little understanding for what is actually meant. So I'm really sorry that I don't really have a good mm -hmm. answer, but I hope this clarifies so Where, where can I find the description of the opera operation now? Um, I, can, I can post the link in the That's chat. Really Give me one second. Okay, thanks. 
And there have been two questions or uh, two similar questions for Sarah about the local culture versus singular systems. And maybe Yasha Jane, I hope I pronounce it right. Maybe you can speak out. Hello. Hi, Sarah. Uh, I wanted to ask on the point where you talked about uh, how Russia has a different response to asking the same question. Uh, do you foresee a future where uh, this is more pronounced, where like individual cultures would be more given more weightage, or do you think it would uh, turn into more of a uniform AI for uh, majority of the world? Thank you. As of so far, our technology has a very homogeneous, very US-centric cultural um, configuration. And um, as we speak about ethics and as we speak about progress, I deeply believe that technology must be more attuned to, to cultural specificities. And I do think that there is no problem to do that because especially AI systems can be, uh, they are trained on local languages. They are trained on local people. Um, they can be offered region wise. Yeah? And I, I, think, I think they should. Um, I also think that this is not, even from a business perspective, that makes a lot of sense because people feel more closer uh, to an agent that, that, that understands their own person, their concerns. And when they use words, what they understand. Right. And I'm going to post the oh, link in the chat, sorry, which is actually really interesting on this point where you can become active yourself. Mozilla has done a project called Common Voice, where you can donate your voice in order to create more cultural diversity. Um, on voice recognition and speech systems. I'm going to post the link here. You can either listen to people speaking and correct it, or you can donate your own voice. Um, when I, I, I would also, um, also in the P7000 standard, um, what is happening is that, um, let's say a value like privacy might be important, but what people understand by privacy, how much they want of it and what are the dimensions of privacy that are important to them is very different from one culture to another. Mm -hmm. Also the degree of surveillance that people, that societies are willing and wanting to embrace is very, very different. And um, I mean, first I'm a German, so I'm very much opposed against surveillance. I don't think it's a good thing to do, but there are cultures that are more open to surveillance. And even if that is a delicate issue, I believe that one thing is for sure, every nation, state or culture must have their debate with their political system on, on how much privacy and how much surveillance they're willing to accept. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't see, I don't think this is Google that should be, uh, um, and or Apple that should be predetermining this for us and um, believing that they know what the right worldwide solution is. Thank you. There has been a question or more a comment from Anna Maria Ballester about the society we are living in. Maybe you want to speak out? Yeah, hi. Yeah. Uh, it was more a comment than a question, really. Um, yeah, about what uh, was said about this, what I said was very frightening about a, um, a device that can see how you feel or that you talk to it and say, you know, Alexa, today I'm feeling really sad. And it says, you know, either uh, it's not a piece of cake or, oh, I want to hug you. Um, how far are we thinking about introducing all of those aspects, as you were just saying, to this technology? Or how far should we say, no, this is not something technology should do. We should um, think about other social systems that can, you know, give what people need in, in terms of company or is this, pe is this person alone? What can we do to help? Is this person having uh, mental problems? That sort of thing. So it, it was also this, this thing you said about either people think technology will solve everything or it's totally bad and, you know, robots will uh, take over and kill us all. 
So how do we find the balance there? Because I do think it has good uses. Like I said, for example, also for people who are on the autism spectrum, for example, they might actually feel better speaking to a machine than to a human because it's, you know, it makes more sense to them. So I don't know if it's a question, but it was a, a comment. I think the question is um, how far, how, how much of what we're investing in AI should we maybe be investing in other social systems and structures? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Well, I, I think that there's a huge opportunity cost to IT investment. I think um, it's it's outrageous that one billion, um, for example, in Austria, we now spend one billion euros on uh, on 5G networks. I think that money would be far better spe spent into into social projects. And um, unfortunately, I think that the rhetoric, as of the um, the language of the IT industry, is is not very humble. It's about this will happen. This will be like this. And because they have so much money and because of the distortion of the financial markets, they continue to have access to resources that, um, that, that they simply built this technology. It's all there right now. And um, perhaps you don't have a speech assistant at home um, and you perhaps belong to the people who also oftentimes don't want to have it at home, but we have those sophisticated systems already. And I mean, if you have a mobile phone, a smartphone in your pocket, and you, you did not look at the, uh, at the terms and conditions that you signed, it may be right now that, that your motion, how, far, how fast you move today, how you feel, how is your tone of voice, what is your vocabulary? All of that, it is analyzed in real time. Data management platforms are sucking on average 30,000 data points from us, from the devices per person to make very complex socio, socio psychological profiles of us. And this is terrible. It's, and it's happening and this is not science fiction. This is happening right now. Thank you. There was also a question from Nelly Hernandez. Maybe you want to say your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the talk, first of all. <laughs> uh, it was really interesting and well, it, it is related like the, um, to the question that Anna asked. Um, because, well, once I saw this film, I don't know if you have heard about it, it's called Hair. And this is about an SO that, yeah, basically it's the romantic partner of this car. So I was wondering if mm, it will be possible to reach that kind of point because, yeah, as um, uh, a guy uh, replied to me, uh, we humans need physical contact. But also I have read that um, in the development of robots, um, well, we humans have like a kind of degree of acceptance. If a robot is too like us, it freaks us out. So <laughs> I don't know, do, do you think it will be possible? <laughs> Kala, if you want to go ahead, it's fine. I, I don't want to take the voice all the time. I just No, go ahead. I think this is more directed at you. The thing is that, um, I, be, I, I, deeply, I have an idea of, 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 of people, of men, of women, men, which is that um, as we go through the world, we, our lived body is resonating with the people around us, with the object around us. And what, what, what they found in research is basically that we can only attribute meaning to things. We can only, for instance, understand what sympathy is and what love is and learn about those values in cooperation with other people as we resonate with each other. When a child resonates with their mother, then the child learns what love is all about. Yeah? Now, yeah. what they found is that when, when, when people interact with machines, 
um, they cannot they cannot learn about, for instance, the concept of love or sympathy, and they also can, they cannot even learn the meaning of words when they interact with a non-human uh, being. Yeah, that's research here. Yeah, research um, as on, on cognitive um, psychological research. So when we speak to speech assistants, um, for instance, a child. The child cannot learn from the robot because the robot cannot share into the resonating relationship between the living being and the artificial being. So if you ask me how I see this future, I believe um, that there, because we already know that humans cannot learn from artificial beings, um, that there is a threat that human beings are True, as, as, that there is this opportunity cost of time for them spending too much time with the machine and less time in the real world. And that not being in the world makes that human beings might be losing some of the richness in their um, identity that they currently have if they spend too much time uh, with those devices. Um, I can add something to this, which is that expressing a hope, which is that if we use the technology right, we actually get more time to spend with each other, with other human beings. Because ideally, um, we use automation. It doesn't need to be AI. It can be a super simple rule-based algorithmic system to take on tasks that are tedious and that have nothing to do with what a lot of humans like to do, which is human interaction, which is creativity, which is the creation of visions. And if we um, yeah, use it to take away those tasks for us, let's say in the field of medicine, doctors that um, have to look at hundreds of radiology pictures and then have very little time to actually sit down with the patient to discuss different treatment options. There's already um, image recognition systems that are used in radiology that are better in identifying cancer on these scans than the actual doctors. So we can use it there and the doctor can actually have more time at the end to interact with the patient. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I think I would like to reply to Carla here. Um, and even, of, of course, I agree that when we talk about very narrow professional uses of, of, of these systems, you are absolutely correct. But when we talk about systems that are deployed in the real world, as long as the business model of um, AI service providers is to have our attention and time absorbed, yeah, this is the current business model. The more you stay, the more you look, the more um, the more uh, money they are making. As long as we have those business models for the private AI um, deployments, we are having that problem that we currently have, which is I don't remember any private use of technology that has saved us time so far. In contrast, we have less time than we ever had. Google Maps, I wouldn't be here without it. I would be lost somewhere, <laughs> but. So uh, maybe we just have uh, time for one more question and there have been a lot of comments from Gregor Braun. Maybe you want to speak out. Gregor Braun. Not there anymore, obviously. And there has also a question from Kuan C. Maybe you want to speak? Hi. Hello. <laughs> if Kuan is not there, I can answer. I just uh, saw that my microphone wasn't um, pu um, put into the uh, PC. It's Gre Gregor Braun speaking. Ah, okay, Gregor. So just ask your question or tell us your um, thoughts. Yeah, it was more um, yeah a comment on um, <clears throat> learning from uh, artificial systems. I think what is, is missing is uh, um, proper 
um, yeah, let's call it a body for the AI. Um, so what is missing is uh, that um, you have a tone in your voice, you can provide mimic as a human being or, or touch uh, each other and so on. And that's what is uh, what I think is missing to make um, people be able to learn from artificial systems. So I would agree on that for now, but I think in future that might change. I wouldn't um, say it in general that you that that for example kids like mentioned can't um, learn from artificial systems. That that was my comment about uh, this statement. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it, 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 I, I, it's, it's a good, it's a good that you say that because um, there is this idea that you just need um, um, sensors or mental representation, also kind of mental representation robots. Um, but um, see, it's about um, it's a form of intelligence that children learn when they jointly point at something. You know that um, if you ever try to point your cat to something, the cat won't understand. It's a specific form of um, joint attention and um, joint meaning attribution. This is what children learn, um, I think, at the, um, at the age of uh, uh, 80 months or, or, or more. I don't know what the age, but it's a specific form of joint meaning making. Um, which, uh, which, is, um, which is something that, um, that we don't know how to how to So is Q and C still there? So I just want to give you the chance also to ask your question. If not, I just want to thank Zara and Carla and also Martin. And I want to announce our upcoming lessons. Um, a sec. So we will have one uh, session about AI and the future of work, one about AI and bias, and one about AI and health. And next time we deal with AI and the future of work with very interesting guests from all over the world. And we hope to see you again and spread the word and mention us in your social media channels. And we would be happy to see you again here. So I hope you have a nice evening or day, depending where you are. And it was great to talk with all of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>